uh, do the introductions and give us a little bit of background of how we got here. So Lisa. Thanks, Joe. So <clears throat> I just wanted to start out and say um, that, I, you know, I think overall for those of us that have been in the monoclonal field and vaccine fields for many years, we sort of take for granted a vector function and um, whether by induced by antigen, like a vaccine or in the case of monoclonals, the function of antibodies is mostly considered to occur through the antigen binding interface. Um, and that's why many of the assays used to determine if an antibody or even a, a vaccine is effective in infectious disease specifically focus on these easy to assess neutralization endpoints. But the, the FC region of an antibody, I think to many people who are on this call, it's obvious, but um, that can actually inter interact with many cells and proteins of the immune system. And so I, just to highlight that the interactions with these effector cells and FC gamma receptors complement, you know, could potentially enhance the effect of an antibody. I think um, they can also, you know, be silenced so that you don't enhance that, that antibody. Um, and we've seen a lot of examples of this within the oncology field. I think many of us have really looked at this in, intensely in the infectious disease field, um, but we haven't really made the strides have, that, that have been, um, that have been uh, overcome in, in, as in the oncology field and, and targeting the different antigens there. Um, and so I know there's been many examples of antibodies um, that mediate protection both preclinically and, and clinically by only binding antigen and not mediating neutralization by the fab and working through effector function. Um, the FC effector function of antibodies is still a field where we have a lot to learn. So about a year ago, um, through the Active Chase, Trace Group, we really recognized a need to pull together the experts in this field to address two important topics. And so, Courtney, I think if you go forward one slide, we can skip over this. Um, but what we did was um, we pulled together uh, uh, two groups of people, um, really experts in the field, to look at two really important topics. And one was the standardiz standardization of effector assays, um, because we, we really recognized that the field needed to move towards assays that could be used in the development of new clinical candidates for, for serious diseases. And then the translation of preclinical effector function to the, the clinical uh, COVID experience. And so these groups were led by two co-chairs and are led by two co-chairs, Galit Alter and Annie Zumsteg. So Annie is at Veer and Galit uh, now at Moderna. And you can see that the participants in these groups really span the expertise across effector function um, and are representative of, of both industry and academia and really brought forward a huge uh, breadth of knowledge in this field. And so for the, the translation group, um, the, the objective really was to put together the seminar series um, and really as, as sort of a, a knowledge sharing endeavor um, where we brought together leading experts in effective function. Um, and the focus of these seminars will really be the major, to address the major gaps in our understanding. Um, and so we're hoping at this point to bring to light the many lessons learned over the course of both vaccine and antibody development, especially as it relates to what we've learned for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so if we could advance the slide, I think I've gone through everything. Um, yeah, so it just, this slide actually highlights um, what the overall vision of these groups really was, the sort of collaborative or collaborative um, initiative. It was through partnerships with many different individuals who I listed on the previous slide, but also others. Um, and then really was executed by a committee um, of these subject matter experts. And so the outcomes of these, are, the outcome of these is really just to, to gather knowledge 
but also look at the relationship of FC receptor and vaccine response and, and efficacy as well as across platforms, and then clarify the relationship between outcomes and effective function of monoclonal antibodies. So I think on the next slide, it just outlines that today's our first uh, two um, speakers. I'm really excited to have them both here. Um, and so without further ado, I will uh, introduce Mark Esser. So Mark, uh, I'm really glad that he's here because we, we tend to uh, to disagree sometimes on some of this, so it'll be really good uh, conversation starter. But uh, Mark is the president of um, the Vice President of Vaccines and Immune Ther Therapies and Early Research and Development at AstraZeneca. Really uh, a force in the field, account accountable for overall drug discovery, translational research, and early clinical development of vaccines and immune therapies. Really widely recognized for contributions in these fields with over 100 peer review publications. Um, and uh, Mark did his doctorate in micro and immunology at the University of Virginia and his postdoc um, fellowship at the AIDS vaccine program at the NIH. And our second speaker, I'm gonna introduce first so we can have a, an uh, easy transition, but our second speaker is uh, Mika Schmid. Um, and he is the director of monoclonal antibody engineering and bioanalytics at Beer and a colleague of mine. Um, I love talking to Mika. He really leads cross-functional teams um, focused on optimization and effector function, FC-mediated immunity, as well as the non-clinical and clinical bioanalytical methods to evaluate PK of uh, monoclonals. He's really dedicated his career to infectious disease and immunology and spans many pathogens from yellow fever all the way to dengue to SARS-CoV-2. Um, Mika received his PhD from uh, the Institute for Research in Biomedicine in Bellinzona and did postdoctoral research at the University of Zurich and the University of California, Berkeley on dendritic cells and DC subsets and teaches me all sorts of stuff on uh, about DCs. So welcome Mark and Mika. I think Mark, you're up first um, and then Mika and then if people have questions, please answer them in the chat as Joe had mentioned but I'm really looking forward to the discussion um, and your presentations. So thank you both. I think you're on mute, Mark. You're still on mute. And I think Mark, if I could read lips, it's the same that he has trouble sharing. Uh. There we go. Starting there we out. go. So thank you, Lisa. And can you guys see it in presentation mode? There we go. Looks good. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's it's a, even a greater pleasure just to share with you a little bit about the Evusheld story, kind of how we went from the lab to the jab. Since we're headquartered in the UK, we don't call them vaccines, we call them jabs. And I kind of love this picture on the right. We affectionately call it our gummy bear antibody structure. And you can see the two antibodies that comprise Evusheld or AZ7442 actually binding to the RBD of the spike protein. And it's, it's even more gratifying because at the time we kind of came up with this, we hadn't solved the crystal structure. And this is kind of where we guessed where the two antibodies were binding. And when we did solve the crystal structure with uh, Jim Crow and the team at Vanderbilt, it's, it's pretty spot on. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, Evusheld and what we've learned along the way. But before that, I just wanted to give a quick overview, just who's AstraZeneca. I'm always surprised, um, maybe because I work here, how few people actually know who AstraZeneca is. A little bit of how we went from discovery through phase one and then uh, flyby on our clinical development programs in both prevention and treatment um, equally, and maybe more important, some recent real world evidence uh, data and then a summary. So um, AstraZeneca, we are a large uh, multinational pharmaceutical company with over 80,000 employees head, uh, with headquarters around the world, obviously with the main two being in Gothenburg, Sweden and in in Cambridge, UK. I'm located in Gaithersburg, Maryland, so just up the road from the NIH. And we're always, um, you know, uh, 
looking forward to having talks and folks visiting us. So if you're ever at the NIH, please look us up. But um, I often have said being in vaccines, um, vaccines aren't for the faint of heart, um, but during the pandemic, we chose to develop both a vaccine and an antibody. So we were either really brave or really foolish, uh, only time in history will tell. But um, although not approved here in, in the US, our vaccine, Vaxevria, we've delivered more than 3 billion doses worldwide at not-for-profit. And some, I think, conservative estimates that were published in The Economist earlier this year estimate at least 6 million lives were saved around the world. So I often say, you know, incredibly proud to be working for a company that wasn't afraid um, to do the hard thing when because we knew it was the right thing. And then, um, Personally, I led the Heavy Shell program in, in addition to supporting the vaccine program. And at a high level, and I'll walk you guys through some of that data that we showed about 77% reduction of symptomatic COVID in the key uh, phase three prevention trial. And then in our outpatient treatment study, about 67% in preventing severe COVID or death when treated within five days of symptom onset. So those are kind of the two numbers to anchor on as, as we think as we go through the presentation. All right, um, and this is kind of a thank you slide because for us, this was kind of our world record at, at AZ is we actually went from starting the program to the emergency use authorization in uh, just, just less than a year ago. It was on December 8th um, last year in 22 months. And you can see we couldn't have done this by ourselves. It was actually, I think, a true example of where public-private partnerships truly worked. And by public-private, I mean the work we did with some of the academic institutes highlighted here, most notably Vanderbilt University, with Jim Crow and the team where we licensed the antibodies, uh, the historical collaborations we had with DARPA and BARDA, of course, working with many of you on the call at the NIH, and then a lot of our commercial partners that helped us run clinical trials and scale up manufacturing where we've been able to deliver um, close to 3 million doses to date. So again, for many of you on the call, I um, my sincere and um, heartfelt thank you on behalf of not just AstraZeneca, but all the patients that have benefited from Evie's show. So uh, shameless plug, um, we're growing and um, no rest for the weary. So we have lots of opportunities and openings at AZ. So please check us out if you're interested at careers.astrazeneca.com or if you have your phone, you can scan that in. So thanks for allowing me to do that. Okay, so I'll switch gears and tell you a little bit about our discovery through phase one program, really just a baseline, everyone on the call, what um, Evusheld is or AZ7442 or Tixagavimab, so Gavimab. And um, it really, um, in terms of disclosure, a lot of this was funded by DARPA and BARDA, and obviously the views are uh, myself and AstraZeneca is not the US government. But uh, just to kind of highlight again that AZ7442 or Tixagavimab, so Gavimab, is a combination of two fully human neutralizing antibodies. Again, they were discovered um, from a discovery campaign at Vanderbilt from two real humans that had been infected with um, SARS-2 and had recovered. You can see on the left is the crystal structure where uh, AZ-1061 and 8895, so Gavimab and Tixagavimab respectively. In the original publications from Jim's lab, it's CUV-2-2130 and CUV-2-2196. And sometimes if you look in the literature, um, those, those numbers are still used when folks are sort of synthesizing and testing antibodies in different studies. What's clear is they bind kind of the head of the RBD that interacts with the ACE2 binding domain. Both antibodies block RBD binding to ACE2. And then on the right, you can see the potency of the two maps individually with um, pretty high potencies in, in the single uh, um, to double digits, and then the combination coming in against 10 nanogram per mil. And I guess, and in this slide, um, this is against the original Wuhan strain, of course. So uh, I won't go through all the work that led to that discovery, but you can imagine it was a kind of Herculean effort. It was executed with military precision. Um, but once we had these two antibodies that we had down selected literally from thousands, um, we made two key enhancements or modifications to the antibody. I think the one decision was pretty straightforward um, and easy for us, and that was to add what we call the YTE modification. And you can kind of see that on the left. What the YTE does is it enhances the affinity 
of the FC region for the neonatal FC receptor, which promotes antibody recycling and really increases the half-life about three to four fold. So we regularly see a 90 day half-life versus the 20 to 25 that we get with a normal IgG when we add the YTE to it. We have some data that suggests it enhances transcytosis to the upper respiratory tract, or perhaps just those levels lead to increased concentrations. So that, so that um, I think we knew we wanted to go for a prophylaxis as an indication with the antibody in addition to treatment. So that decision was fairly straightforward. The second one we agonized over, and at the time, Nicole uh, Calloward Lillet, who was um, a virologist and myself at the time, went back and forth, I think, about like a uh, hundred times on this, whether to add what we call the TM modification or triple modification, which um, significantly reduces, if not ablates, FC effector function with those three amino acids that do two things. One, significantly reduces binding to the FC receptor, and then appears to completely knock out binding of, of C1Q complement to the FC receptor. And the goal there at the time, is, as many of you on the call may remember, was the concern about enhanced disease or even enhanced infection with antibodies against coronaviruses. So the thinking was it would decrease the likelihood of immunopathology, um, but at potentially at the risk of giving up some effector activity and some efficacy. And of course, I'll show you some of our clinical data in the upcoming slides. So as, as I just said, in rare cases, we know antibodies can enhance disease. I think kind of the quintessential um, case of this is dengue virus, where antibodies can actually bind to the virus to non-neutralizing epitopes, engage with FC gamma receptors, and actually enhance infection or viral replication. Um, I think I was not too concerned about that personally. I think what I was more concerned about on the right is that um, an antibody could lead to excessive inflammation or immune complex formation that could lead to enhance disease. So, and that could be through two or three mechanisms. One, the antibodies activating immune cells, leading to chemokine, cytokine release, leading to an influx of additional white blood cells, cytokine storm. And then secondly, activation of complement uh, and immune complex disease. And if you think of an example, kind of the tragic study of the formalin inactivated RSV vaccine in the 1960s in the study ran by the NIH where a number of children were given that uh, formalin and heat inactivated vaccine. They did fine during the first RSV season, but in the second RSV season, they had enhanced disease. I think 12 of the kids were hospitalized and tragically two died. So these were the things we were thinking about at the time. Obviously, kind of in the fog of war, we didn't have a lot of information about uh, SARS-2 and COVID. So we did make the decision to put that TM modification into, into the antibodies. And this is some work where we had sent off the antibodies up to seromics uh, to have them characterized. And what you can see in the top line is AZ7442. So this contains the YTE and TM modification, pretty much knocks out um, antibody-dependent cellular phag phagocytosis, cytotoxicity, complement deposition, and NK cell activation. A little residual binding um, to THP1 cells. And in contrast, you can see the AZ7442 right below it with no FC modification where we had high levels of binding and activation. So that's what um, AZ7442 is. Before we took the antibodies into the clinic, we ran two, we ran quite a number of hamster studies, but ran one uh, large primate study in both prophylaxis and treatment. What you're seeing here on this slide is the prophylaxis where the animals we're given the antibodies three days prior to a challenge with 10 to the fifth TCID 50s of SARS-2, followed for 14 days. On the lower left, you can look at viral load in the lungs or bronchiovillar lavage, and you can see a four mig and 40 mig per kg dose completely suppressed viral replication that we could detect in the lungs. And much to uh, my surprise, uh, pleasant surprise, that at 40 megs and even at four megs per kg significantly reduced the levels of virus that we could detect in a nasal swab. And having worked in flu and RSV over the years, this isn't something we normally see. Uh, the antibodies also worked in treatment, uh, even with the FC modifications and TM modification. On the left, you can see um, uh, the virus load levels in the lungs after the animals were challenged with the virus one day later. 
given AZ7442, you can see by day four, all the animals have uh, viral loads that are undetectable. And there was a modest but statistically significant in, um, effect in the nasal swabs, which again, to me, having done these sorts of studies with other respiratory viruses, I was pleasantly surprised. And again, with, with the TM modification in there. All this has been published by Lou et al. in Science Translational Medicine. And this gave us the confidence to take uh, the antibodies into the clinic to both um, for phase one safety, but then also to run in efficacy studies. This is just some additional data in that Science Transmed paper showing the extended half-life in the left. Uh, it's really spot on right at 90 days, whether we give the antibodies intramuscularly or given, give them as an IV dose. And on the right is sort of translating those PK values into neutralizing antibody levels. And what you can see is a single dose of the antibodies actually afford or provide very high neutralizing antibody titers, 10 to 50 fold higher than those associated with convalescent serum. And just to sort of also benchmark you, know, kind of the Moderna um, Pfizer vaccines, at least when we run those samples in this assay, come in around 120, 150 after people have uh, gotten a booster dose. So these are high neutralizing antibody levels in the serum, which do translate to what we detect in the nasal lining fluid. On the left is just kind of that schematic how the FCRN uh, mediated transport, transcytosis and reverse transport works shown here on the left. And then I think gratifyingly, when we looked in nasal lining fluid, we used kind of a special device for the first time to collect this. Uh, we could detect levels kind of in that about 0.1 to 0.5 microgram uh, per mil level when we gave them a 300 milligram IM dose and well over a microgram per mil at the, at the highest dose we tested, which was 3000 megs IV. So that is kind of what gave us the confidence to run a number of clinical studies and kind of doing a, a quick flyby here. These are highlighted on this slide where we did everything from prevention with the Provence study on the left side to a post-exposure prophylaxis study called Storm Chaser right here in the middle, um, looking at both post-exposure prophylaxis and preemptive treatment. Both of these, the endpoint was looking at the prevention of symptomatic COVID. And in, in our outpatient treatment studies, one we did with the active two NIH group where we compared an IM versus an IV dose of administration. Our own internal study was called Tackle, where we looked at a single 600 milligram IM dose. And then on the far right uh, were two hospitalization studies. We did one with the NIH called Active 3 uh, with uh, um, Hadik in, in, in Jens London. So I'll kind of high, give you one slide or two on each of those highlighting the data going from left to right. So here, here's the ProVent data. Um, which was a pretty big prophylaxis study, about 5,200 subjects. Again, the indication was prevention of symptomatic COVID, and much to my chagrin, that endpoint includes runny nose and congestion, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But even with that very sensitive clinical endpoint, you can see there was about an 82 or 83% relative risk reduction at six months with 11 cases in the um, Evishell group and 31 in the placebo group. So remember, this was a two to one randomization study. So for every two people that got uh, Tixa and Silga, one person got placebo. So it's really 11 versus 62. If you do the math, it translates to about that 83% relative risk reduction, good safety profile. And all this has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, if just me playing with the data, which I know is post hoc analysis, if you just remove runny nose and congestion as endpoints, the efficacy climbs up above 92%. Okay, so the second study we did was a post-exposure prophylaxis study or storm chaser. And I think in the fog of war and going fast, um, I wish I had a chance to do it over again because we can combine both the um, post-exposure prophylaxis group and preemptive treatment group into one group versus teasing them apart, at least as our primary. And I'll show you sort of the secondary. But uh, the original goal with Storm Chaser um, was to actually go into care homes and nursing homes. So Storm Chaser actually stands for something. It was our study to optimally reduce morbidity in care homes and sites of elevated risk of infection. If you kind of think back to the um, Helen Hunt, Bill Paxson movie, um, Twister, where they were chasing after storms. That was kind of the, the idea for the study name. 
And we actually had mobile units that were going to go to a lot of the care homes and nursing homes. Right about the time we started the study, the Pfizer vaccine became available. So all those opportunities were um, then off the table. And this really turned into a, uh, a family contact study where we included people who had a contact or in a potential exposure within the past eight days. Um, good safety profile. This was just recently published uh, this week in Clinical Infectious Disease. And what you can see is overall, there was a 33% reduction in symptomatic COVID. Again, that included the stuffy nose and congestion in the endpoint. When we look just in the pre-play and subgroup group analysis of the PCR negative people, there was 73% reduction. You can see that it was statistically significant. And when we looked at uh, subjects more than seven days um, from that were PCR negative, the efficacy rose to 92%. And that's kind of highlighted on the next slide uh, in a Kaplan-Meier. You can see, um, looking at the cumulative incidence of symptomatic COVID, there's a big bolus of uh, cases that occur within the first 10 days. These are people that were clearly infected when they enrolled in the study and we start counting cases. And uh, what you can see there is, Obviously, Evyshield did not prevent people that were already infected from developing symptomatic COVID. But then as you get past 11 days, you can see we start to accrue cases in the placebo arm, and we did not accrue very many cases in the um, Evyshield arm with that 92% uh, overall efficacy. Interestingly, when we broke it down into PCR negative, even in the first 10 days, there was about a 50% benefit. So these people were clearly infected at baseline, at least in my mind, but the ones that were early in infection, i.e. weren't testing positive yet, uh, there seemed to be some benefit in that fewer of those actually be, uh, became symptomatic in the um, heavy shell group versus the placebo group. And again, as you look forward, as you look further out, we continue to accrue more cases in the placebo arm than in the heavy shell arm. So really the takeaway here is that these antibodies, um, certainly in people that are infected at time of treatment are not gonna prevent symptomatic COVID, i.e. if you have the virus in you, giving someone a bolus of antibodies isn't gonna prevent congestion or stuffy nose or even a little bit of a, a sore throat. But switching gears into what happens if you treat people early in infection and you change the endpoint looking at uh, prevention of severe COVID or hospitalization or death was really what the tackle study was. And this was treating people who were symptomatic, i.e. had symptoms of COVID-19 and were at uh, moderate to high risk for having a severe outcome. So it was really enriched for a patient population that was high risk, mostly diabetes, heart disease, COPD, obesity were the folks that we enrolled in this study. Again, a good safety uh, profile. I was published recently in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. And you can see when we um, identified folks within seven days of symptom onset, there was a 50% reduction of uh, severe COVID or hospitalization through day 29. When we look on the next slide, you can see the Kaplan-Meier. And one of the key takeaways is folks that are pretty far gone, already infected late in their disease course, the antibody did not prevent them from developing uh, severe COVID, but what you can see um, is that there is a benefit starting at around day five, kind of flipping this curve, um, because I think people often get confused looking at this, thinking, oh, the antibody doesn't, it takes five days to start working, is really not the case. It just means that if you've been sick for seven days, kind of shown over here, there's less benefit uh, getting an antibody versus somebody who's only been sick for two days. So for example, someone who's only had symptoms for two days, we had zero cases in the Evusheld arm versus three in the placebo arm. If we caught people within three days, one versus eight, four days, four versus 17. And there's sort of a stepwise decrease in efficacy uh, based on how soon you treat people. So kind of the two takeaways here are, I think with all antibody treatments and in infectious disease, you wanna hit hard and you wanna hit early. Um, but again, we did see a treatment effect even with that TM modification, ablating FC receptor binding and complement uh, activation. Okay. And then the last study, which um, uh, was a bit of a surprise to me, was the ACTIVE-3 study. So again, we did this in collaboration with the NIH where we provided Evyshelled 
uh, to, to the NIH and Active 3 team. And this was a pretty sick population. Um, they were in the hospital. They had, were randomized within 12 days of COVID-19 symptoms. So they were pretty far along. Um, and uh, they were, uh, and a number of them were already on high flow oxygen. So what you can see here is the primary endpoint of sustained recovery through 90 days was not met, 89% in the Tixis silga arm versus 86% in placebo, so not statistically significant. But what was interesting was there was a reduction in all-cause mortality through day 90. So you can see 9% of uh, the subjects in the Tixis silga arm succumbed to COVID-19 versus 12% in the placebo arm for a hazard ratio of 0.7 or a 30% reduction in all-cause mortality, which was statistically significant. This is just showing uh, time to sustained recovery uh, on this slide, and that was defined as um, a return to home for 14 consecutive days. So there wasn't a statistically a significant difference between those treated with ticks and silga versus placebo. Um, but interestingly, and there was no uh, difference based on zero status, which I think others had seen in some of the treatment studies that were done with, uh, I think, the recovery group in the UK. Uh, but when we did look at all-cause mortality, what you can see here in the placebo group, about 12% of the subjects succumbed to COVID-19. In the Tixa silver group, it was only uh, 9%. Again, this was statistically significant. And importantly, when we broke it out into the zero negatives versus zero positives, there was no difference, um, which I think was encouraging because I think some of the other studies that were published showed that there was a difference in the zero negative versus zero positives. In my mind, that could be a clue that the FC um, receptor domain of the antibodies is playing a role. And then, so this is just kind of a nice summary slide uh, for all those, for those four studies. Again, in prevention, it's about 83% reduction in that prophylaxis uh, uh, modality out to six months. Again, rises up over 90% if you get rid of runny nose and congestion. In the storm chaser post-exposure prophylaxis, again, did not meet the primary endpoint, but in the PCR negative group, it was 73 and 92% reduction in symptomatic COVID. In the tackle study, in the treatment study, efficacy ranged from 50% to 80% with the um, higher efficacy based on treating earlier. So if you catch people within three days of symptom onset, it was 88% reduction in severe COVID or death. And then, um, you know, to, in my mind, it was surprising that the antibody showed a 30% reduction in all-cause mortality in the ACTIVE-3 study. And also pointing out, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this was the only monoclonal to pass through the safety futility analysis and actually make it into the phase three efficacy portion of the active three study. Okay. And then just two or three slides on real world evidence. Um, so I'm sure somebody's thinking, well, in your prevention studies, those weren't in immunocompromised people. And in fact, it was only about, I think, 6% of the folks in, those, in the prevention study that actually meet the criteria for being immunocompromised. And we know that immunocompromised folks are at much higher risk of severe COVID-19, hospitalization and death, <clears throat> you know, uh, 3x, you know, threefold more likely to be hospitalized, one and a half times end up in the ICU, and twofold more likely to die. So we know that I think they only make immunocompromised people only make up about two to three percent of the population, but are making up about 40 percent of the hospitalizations worldwide. So we um, and this is because, and, and to this group, we don't need to say this, we know that immunocompromised people don't respond well to vaccination. And there's different levels of uh, being immunocompromised. We know cancer patients, depending if they're hematological cancers or uh, solid tumor cancers, have very different sort of out, um, responses based on treatment. You can see that in the left. Hemodialysis patients, we see quite, quite a range. Obviously, anyone who's gotten an organ transplant or hematopoietic stem cell transplants being treated with rituximab that completely depletes B cells uh, significantly reduces the vaccine antibody response. Um, this is just a, a study uh, that came out uh, just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's not from us at AstraZeneca, just looking at a meta-analysis of 17 clinical studies in about 25,000 immunocompromised patients, a little more than 10,000 received TIXA 
And so gabamab and kind of the numbers you can remember are kind of 40, 70, 90. And that in the, these uh, real world evidence studies, about 40% prevention of uh, breakthrough infection or symptomatic COVID, about 70% reduction in hospitalization and about 87 or 90% reduction in ICU admission. And then overall, when you look at um, all cause mortality and um, for COVID-19 is about 80 and 86% respectively. The three studies that we were involved in are shown on this slide, or at least we um, were in contact with uh, the investigators to keep track of them. On the left is a study that we've done with the VA or Veterans Affairs Administration here in the US. You can see about an 87% reduction in hospitalization in subjects uh, that receive TIXA and SILGA versus control groups in this retrospective analysis. In Israel, a prospective study was done in a very heterogeneous immunocompromised population. You can see the uh, hazard ratio or sort of incident rate in the placebo group versus the TIXA SILGA group down here for about 92% reduction. And then a study in uh, largely transplant, solid organ transplant patients in France, you can see the incident rate per 100,000 subjects in blue during Delta and BA1 and BA2 here versus the incident rate of uh, hospitalization for those that got TIX and silgavimab here in kind of this red plum color. So in all three studies, uh, showing good efficacy in an immunocompromised population who largely has reduced white blood cells. Okay, so in summary, um, I think TIXA and SOGA were shown to be effective in preventing symptomatic COVID, severe COVID um, in both healthy subjects and immunocompromised subjects. It prevents uh, hospitalization and death and treatment. Could it work in hospitalized uh, patients to prevent all-cause mortality? I, I think probably we would need to redo that study to really prove it. Is the FC receptor engagement required for efficacy and prevention and treatment? I would say no. Um, but would that FC receptor binding and complement binding um, enable better efficacy and prevention? Uh, don't know, maybe. And maybe it would have a benefit in treatment for uh, an outpatient or inpatient treatment. I think the jury's still out, and I'll be curious to everybody's um, comments and, and questions. So uh, I think, you know, most gratifyingly, I've had a chance to meet some of the patients that have received Evisheld, and it's really been rewarding that we are really providing hope to a lot of folks that uh, didn't have it, and we're still sort of being locked up due to COVID. And then a big thank you to all of you for listening, and so many of you that participated in these studies and um, getting every shell to the patients that need it most. So with that, I will say thanks. We can't hear you, Joe. Sorry. Mark, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate the fact that not having to raise my hands and make a lot of noise to get you to uh, to, to stop. So perfect timing. Um, as we said at the beginning, we're going to hold questions till the end, but please put them into the Q&A so that um, uh, Dr. Esser can actually see them ahead of time and maybe start planning the uh, the response if, if there is one. And uh, in the meantime, um, we're going to go right to the next talk and, um, and have uh, Mikhail uh, do his presentation, which we can see very well on the, uh, the, um, the Zoom meeting. So Mikhail, that's up to you. I'll leave it to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me well as well? Sounds good, Mika. Thank you. And thanks, Lisa, for the introduction and Joe for, for getting us all together. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining, like all over the planet and also my colleagues here in Valenzona. I'm presenting from Switzerland today from Humaps. We are a full subsidiary of VR Biotechnology in San Francisco, and we are the antibody um, core here um, and for VR. And I would like to present to you today the story of Sotrovimab. Um, here's my disclaimers. And first of all, thank all my colleagues here at Humaps and then at Veer across the globe 
but then especially also our collaborators and partners at GSK who helped um, us and brought um, Sotrovimab forward to the patients. And plus our, our academic collaborators at Washington University, above all Samantha Makin, Brad Chase, and Mike Diamond, but then also our other collaborators at the Rockefeller University, Karl Löwen, and the University of Washington. A quick outline of the talk. So I'll be mostly focusing on Sotrovimab or its parental, which is called S309 and give you a, just a very brief recap again of effective functions and our view um, of their potential importance for broadly neutralizing antibodies. And then give you um, quite like a view on recent preclinical data um, in different animal models, which are trying to dissect how important actually are FC gamma receptor mediated and FC mediated effective functions during a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then answer the question, can we even potentially further increase it? And then go into depth, uh, not just for the Wuhan strains, but then also look for the currently circulating um, Omicron variants. And how important is it there if potentially neutralization and binding does um, alter to some extent, how important are then effector functions mediated by the FC? And also at the end, I would like to give you a brief glimpse on current real world evidence, especially about the Omicron BA2 variant. So first briefly, very briefly again on the effector functions and as Lisa said, like of course the FABs of the antibody, they are binding the antigen, are mediating virus neutralization, but then there's the FC and you also can see here that it can be modified. For example, here in yellow at the very bottom is like the LS mutation, which is half-life extended. So it's effective functions, FC gamma receptor binding, as well as half-life extension, similar to the YTE that Dr. Essa has mentioned. But for the FC gamma receptor mediated effective functions, so there's um, several key mechanisms that can help and protect against a viral infection. So the one is mediated by NK cells and it's called ADCC or antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So killing of an infected cell. So an NK cell expresses mostly FC gamma receptor 3A and recognizes if antibodies are bound to the surface of a cell because then they have viral antigen if they are infected on their surface and can directly kill those. Macrophages can sometimes do that as well. But then macrophages and monocytes, other phagocytes like neutrophils are really important in ADCP, so antibody dependent phagocytosis. And there's also, it's more a co-play of different FC gamma receptors, 2A activating, but also inactivating 2B receptors. And the 3A might also play a role there. And the key point is during an infection, but also for prophylaxis that a virion is opsonized with, um, vir with antibodies. And I think in my mind, always for neutralization, you pretty much have to envelop that virus completely with the antibody and cover it to completely neutralize it. But if just a couple antibodies are bound, that virion can still be eliminated by phagocytosis and not be able to infect a cell then. But that phagocytosis might have another benefit, which is that if it's taken up into an antigen presenting cell, like a dendritic cell or some of these macrophage monocyte populations, of course, then it takes up those immune complexes, degrades the viral pep uh, proteins into peptides and presents them to CD4 and CD8 T cells. So other than a short-term effect, there's a potential benefit for a long-term effect and we call that vaccinal effect to increase T cell responses. And that can happen for CD4 or CD8 T cells. So with that, I would like to start some, and this is published work um, from the Ravage team, just to give a general um, overview or that there's really different classes of antibodies and different antibodies might really, I don't think you can answer the questions like all antibodies need effective functions and all antibodies can get without, um, off without it. I think it really depends on a lot of factors, including the epitope and the antibody itself. So you see here, for example, in a whole panel of antibodies that some of them and one like really potent one, which in uh, this animal model, which is bulb sea mice, <clears throat> it really, the 104 really potently reduces um, the viral load in the lungs. 
But it also shows that it um, very strongly depends on effector functions, because if the GRLR mutation is one which abrogates FC gamma receptor binding, and you see it compared to the wild type, a potent reduction of lung viral load, you lose that if you go for GRLR. In the other case, there's another antibody which is like acts the same way with or without effector functions. And then also looking at the IC50 neutralization, that one which is one of the most potent ones in vivo, does actually have the highest IC90 value, so it's not as potent in neutralization. So you already see here that different antibodies, um, there's a disconnect. You cannot say potent in vitro neutralization equals potent in vivo um, efficacy. And you'll hear me say that quite a lot. And then of course it's interesting, like what role do effector functions play then in this context? And that, that'll be the main question I'll try to answer today. And so with that, as I said, like there's very different antibodies and therefore different companies also with those antibodies have taken very different approaches. Like for some of them, they have, uh, again, SARS-CoV-2, they have a wild type IgG. Others have introduced a LALA mutation, which um, abrogates effector functions in FC gamma receptor binding. For our own um, Sotovimab, and I'm here with some of the scientists who have discovered that antibody, um, is we half-life extended it via an LS mutation, but that LS mutation increases binding to FCRN and half-life in vivo, but not, does not alter effector functions. So effector functions are, let's say, normal or wild type in this antibody. And um, we even have a second um, variant of Sotrovimab, which has a Galia mutation, which does increase um, F effector functions in FC-gamma receptor binding, and their clinical trials are still ongoing. Or well, then if you, if you just heard other um, like antibodies from AstraZeneca, for example, have the YTE and TM mutations, which do then increase half-life and abrogate effector functions. So you see it's, it's, there's really different approaches. And as I said, I think it really, it's really depending on the antibody itself. So going and giving you a very brief overview to Sotrovimab, and I won't go into the, um, into the published clinical data, but um, another name for it is VIR7831, or the parental antibody, which only one amino acid difference in the um, CDRs is S309, so the original discovered one. And it's very broadly neutralizing also because it was discovered from an individual who in 2002 had actually a SARS, so SARS-1 infection, and it neutralizes broadly from SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2. So that also already showed our strategy that we were looking like for an as broad antibody as possible, also having in mind that then if we had a concerned site on the SARS-CoV-2 spike, that this could then also potentially be more resistant, this antibody to virus escape mutations. It binds the RBD outside the RBM, so has only a partial um, competition with ACE2 receptor binding and is a conserved epitope. And on the effector functions, there are several aspects which are important. First of all is that it does not induce shedding. So that can happen that some antibodies bind and induce a shedding of this one um, part of the spike protein. That means that the antigen is gone and then there cannot be effector functions left. So the epitope is important, but also the angle of binding seems to be important here. It's roughly 90%, and that gets the effector cells and the target cells um, closer together, so making effector functions also more effective. Also, how many antibodies can bind, so avidity and oc occupancy are important. Overall, in the clinical data, um, sotrovimab led to reduced hospitalizations in, uh, and risk of death in early treatment. And so that led to an emergency use authorization via the FDA and full market authorization within several countries in Europe and globally in 2021 for treatment of mild to moderate um, COVID-19 in high risk adults, adults and pediatric patients. Then for some uh, um, reason of in vitro neutralization and shift some reduction of neutralization to BA2 Omicron variants, that emergency use authorization in the US was revoked in April 2022, whereas then Sotrovimab is kept on being used um, in, in other countries of the world. And there at the end, I wanna show you some real world data.
So now back to the preclinical studies and animal models. So that first piece of evidence I wanted to show you is if S309 has a human FC in a hamster model, and this is early therapy on day one, um, uh, you see here that compared to the blue wild type, if you have GRLR abrogated binding to FC gamma receptors, you also have a not a partial loss of protection for lung viral titers in these animals. So that already showed that effector functions are important. That was the first piece of data. But in this model, even if um, that might be underestimated because the human FC does not bind as well to the hamster receptors as, as a hamster FC would do. So we wanted to look and check in several other models. So here, for example, these are wild type mice. Um, or mice which then have a knockout for FC gamma receptors. And that's done in collaboration with Samantha Makin and Mike Diamond at WashU. And this data is also unpublished. And I want to just um, bring your attention right away here to the infectious virus in the lung. And here, if the black six wild type animals you see compared to an isotype control in black, there's a dramatic decrease of lung bar load in this prophylaxis model at three mix per kick dosing of S309 now with the, with the murine FCs. We tried here, we are matching the FC gum receptors in the mice and on the antibody. But then if we give the same antibody into mice which do not have um, FC gum receptors, you see there is still some protection left, but dramatically less. So to dissect that, the difference here in the knockout mice between black isotope control and the antibody, this is the effect of neutralization alone, whereas in the differences between the two red lines, this is all due to effector functions. So you see how important they are. So we wanted to further dissect that, not just see of this antibody, how important are they, but which FC gamma receptors are mediating that protection, and could we, in theory, also further boost or increase them? So now we switch, still in collaboration with the lab of Mike Diamond, um, we switch to mice, which do express the human FC gamma receptors. So the mouse variants, um, homologs are knocked out, and they express the human one. And you see here, for example, in turbinates are also the lung for infectious virus that here in that case, black is an isotype control, gray is the GRLR, so no effector functions, and then the wild type antibody. So you see stepwise neutralization effector functions to orange. The green is a GA mutation, which is specifically increasing FC gamma receptor 2A. And you see that we can further boost that protection in this therapeutic model. So the antibodies was dosed eight hours after the infection. Whereas then afucosylation, which is a modification, you get rid of the fucose on the sugar chain of the antibody that is known to specifically increase FC gum receptor 3A binding. That alone did not change it compared to wild type, but potentially, um, if you look at viral RNA, a combination of increased 2A and 3A might play a role. So I, my bottom line is FC gum receptor 2A is important and can further be boosted. 3A might play an additional role in this model. But then to answer a very important question we wanted to know, and that's also what um, Dr. Esso said in the beginning, uh, if there's any additional inflammation or how do the antibodies actually act and how do, the how do the lungs look of these animals? So here a healthy mock infected, so non-infected lung, you see all these open spaces, nice airways and some blood vessels. Whereas then in an isotype controlled treated animal, <clears throat> which was infected, you see that there's much less airways and a lot of infiltrates of all of these inflammatory cells. Then when we treat with <clears throat> S309, which is abrogated effector functions, it looks similar to a non-treated. So from the prior, I showed you that there's some reduction in viral load, but you have the similar infiltration of an inflammation still in the lung. So without effector functions, not able to completely eliminate that. Whereas then with intact effector functions, so normal ones, you see again like these open, nice airway spaces and clearance of so much less inf infiltration of inflammatory cells. And similarly, it looks if we even increase further the FC gamma receptors. So there's no signs of antibody-dependent enhanced in disease, the opposite. 
there's a really decreased infiltration of inflammatory cells. And if we look at um, cytokines, inflammatory cytokines in the lungs, you see that actually even for all three variants with, with wild type or our increased effective functions, we have overall a broad decrease of inflammatory cytokines for all three variants compared to the isotype control. So now that is kind of all the, the basic science on how important are the effective functions. And now I want to go to the currently evolving situation of the pandemic and all the new waves of Omicron currently um, subvariants. And I don't want to go too much into the details of the different variants, but to show you a couple pieces of data um, here from Brad Chase et al. that show you, and this is one piece of data I also want to show you on, on EvoShield, which was um, tested separately in the same study that as you as you've heard it has abrogated effector functions so it's entirely relying on the potent neutralization potency but that does also change to some extent um, in the ic50 or neutralization in vitro neutralization values and you see that compared to the the d614 is the wuhan original and you see that as for example for b1 ba11 there's less neutralization and you also see somewhat less protection in these mice. Whereas then for S309, the parent of sotrovimab, you also see the potent um, decrease for the um, Wuhan virus. And actually in vitro, we did see a substantial decrease of neutralization in, uh, in, vitro, neutralization, yeah, in vitro neutralization, but we still saw maintained good protection um, for BA1, 1, 1, and BA2 in this mouse model. And these are actually, in that case, K18 mice, which overexpress ACE2. And they were dosed, so it's a prophylactic um, study one day before infection with the antibody. But then we did the same viral variants infected in the mice and used an antibody as with GRLR. And you saw only for the Wuhan, there's still some protection, but for the others, BA1 and BA2, there was completely abrogation of this protection that we see. So that really gave us the hint that if there's potential reduced neutralization, there's still efficacy, but that then almost entirely depends on the effector functions. And here you see again that for the Evoshed chilled the AstraZeneca antibody, you have a very clear correlation between in vitro neutralization potency and lung viral titer and protection of these animals. Whereas then for so, um, S309, where effector functions play an important role, we do not see any correlation at all. So it's a much more complex situation. And I think we really have to consider that also um, when we make decisions on use of these antibodies. Here on the right, you see that there's a very good maintained effector function. So against Wuhan, you see here the bar of ADCC and ADCP. This is the area under the curves. But then for BA1 and BA2, there's like as good induction of NK cell mediated cytotoxicity or phagocytosis for BA1 and BA2. Here again, this is dissecting a bit more the in vitro neutralization. And you see BA1 is quite maintained compared to Wuhan for um, here for Sotrovimab. But then you see that for BA2, 4, and 5, there's somewhat reduction. And there for BA2, for example, there's an 18-fold reduction of in vitro neutralization. There's also a bit of a reduction of binding to the surface of XB Cho cells, which is press the different spike variants. But it's importantly, there's maintained binding. But then if we look at the effector functions here, BA4, 6, or 5, they're as good as for the Wuhan virus. And then if we're looking for all of them, Wuhan in ADCC and K-cell mediated from BA1, BA2 up to BA5, completely maintained in vitro effector functions for this using primary human cells, as well as monocyte mediated um, phagocytosis. Potentially a little bit decreased in BA2, but this is not significant. So having this in mind that probably some neutralization decrease, but maintained effector functions I just very briefly want to wrap up that and then show you some real-world evidence. 
So I've shown you that there's FC mediated factor functions and they are really important in addition to the neutralization potency of Sotovimab or S309. These are maintained for BA1 and BA2. And we have not in all of these experiments not seen any signs at all of um, antibody dependent enhancement of disease. And these potent effector functions might be really due to no spike shedding, high occupancy of the antibody on the spike, meaning that three IgGs of Sotovimab can simultaneously bind the spike at the open and closed position. So that gives also a high density of CFCs that then the factor cells can bind to. And the binding angle at approximately 90 degrees also brings these NK cells or LDA factor cells close to the target cells. And then that also makes a more efficient binding. So with that, then back to the clinical history now of Sotovimab and some real world evidence most like um, collected globally. As I said, the emergency use authorization was given um, for Sotrovimab in the US following the results from the phase three clinical trial Comet ICE in May 2021. But then the FDA deauthorized Sotrovimab in April 2005 because they saw that there was some reduction in in vitro neutralization against the BA2 variant. And, um, but the Sotovimab remained authorized in approximately 40 countries globally and is um, in the highest use in the UK as joint one and Germany and Japan. But what we really need to know is like, can that be based on the neutralization alone or does the factor function and other factors play also a role? So this is why we looked at real world um, evidence for the efficacy against comparing BA1 and BA2. So if I remind you, the BA1 was neutralization as almost as good as the Wuhan virus. And here on the bottom left, you see that compared to Molnupiravir, there was um, better protection in this um, real world data, which was collected in an open safely software from the National Health Services in England. And then you saw that on the right side, you see that then for individuals who were infected with BA2 Omicron variant, you saw a similar efficacy and increased protection for Sotrovimab. So no difference between the two, even though we know that for BA2, there's um, an in decrease in neutralization. This is then um, collection of data and real world data for, from many studies. And for some of them, you see the untreated control is in blue, so Tovimab in orange and Monopiravir in gray. But overall, the bottom line is we have decreased um, rate of hospitalizations in this total number of almost uh, 37,000 individuals which were dosed with 500 milligrams IV. And there's no difference between BA1 and BA2. And just to show that data in a different way without the um, non-treated comparator, if you look here, BA1 is in purple and BA2 in pink. And you see that throughout similar low rates of progression and so similar good rates of protection for individuals who are infected with these two. So that makes us confident that um, it seems from the so far collected data, the clinical efficacy may be maintained. So to sum up that second part, the real world, world evidence today show low rates of hospitalization with um, after treatment with Sotrovimab. Agar SARS-CoV, there was some Delta, but then Omicron BA1 and BA2. Um, these data sources suggest that Sotrovimab retains clinical efficacy at 500 milligrams against BA2, despite the 18-fold shift of neutralization. And we are continuing this monitoring um, together with GSK, including the BA5 and beyond ongoing Omicron variants. So with that, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take the joint the questions and the joint discussion. And yeah, in case I'll also pull up again the slide for the pre call. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear yeah. So so thank you very much because that was that was terrific um, and, and very interesting uh, uh, data, great data actually.
um, and very, very nicely presented. We do have a couple of, of questions in the, um, the Q&A um, and uh, I'll just read them. And then uh, maybe uh, this is, these both are towards uh, S309 uh, and, and Satrivimab, but uh, we'll go start from there. So a uh, question from uh, Jackie Kirchner, does S309 with the Gailey uh, plus or minus LS mutation exhibit increased protection in mice or hamsters? So G-A-A-L-I-E plus or minus LS. And that would be to, I'm thinking is to Mika. Yeah. Um, so in, in the hamsters, it's it's not easy to address that question and it's mostly due to the model. So in, in hamsters, we cannot really say there's somewhat increased binding, but it's still a different um, binding because that Gali mutation on the human FC and cannot directly be translated into then binding hamster FCs. So overall, we have seen that there's some increased binding, but it does not mir mirror the um, human situation exactly. And then, uh, um, yeah, we and we haven't we haven't tested it all the way through yet in the mice with the human FC gamma receptors. So we don't we don't have the data, so I, we don't know exactly how big that benefit is of Gallia. And the, and the follow-up question from her is, uh, is protection from um, better than uh, VR 7831? Yeah, that would be, I believe that would be the same question. So um, unfortunately, we don't have that exact comparator data in the mice with and, the human FC gamma receptors, yeah. And, and are there clinical results for 7832? It's ongoing. Um, the recruitment for that study was quite slow, so that study is ongoing. So we don't have any results. No. Okay. And then a uh, question from uh, Yin Ji: How is binding affinity of S309 to BA245 RBD compared to wild type RBD? So there's a direct mm -hmm. binding assay, a back direct binding question. Yeah. So I can probably pull up that slide again. Um, that was that was the data I showed here. So here, oh no, it asks me to enter. Great, yeah. Yeah, but I can I can clearly probably say that was the binding data I showed um, on the surface of XP Cho cells, which were transiently transfected with the different SARS-CoV-2 spikes. And here at the bottom, there, um, there's a somewhat reduction. We can't really calculate um, like EC50 binding values because it, we don't have the full plateaus, but there's retained binding. So that was probably that question down here. So that's the total map binding to the different BA1, 2, 4, 5, and 4.6 variants. So I think important for the effector function is that there is retained binding. And then we also believe that the valency, so of course then we have um, two arms of the FAB can bind. And then also if then on the surface of a cell, several antibodies have bound and the FCs are sticking out, that is can be even recruited into almost like an immunological synapse with the FC gamma receptors on the, on the effector cell. So then therefore you get like a much higher binding density and valency. And we think that's the reason why some decreased binding FAP mediated in that higher valency can be really overcome and still mediated good effector functions. Okay. Another question. Do you have an, from Ann Eakin, uh, do you have an estimate for the extent of neutralization activity lost, uh, i.e. fold reduction in EC90 that could be overcome by FC functional, functionality? Real world evidence suggests 18x, 18 x 18-fold reduction can be covered, but do you expect there will be some threshold for required uh, activity? Yeah. It would be it would be great to have that magic number up to up to which can we compensate. I think that's also depends a lot on the antibody. So here, for example, in this study in vitro for BA4 and 5, we have an up to 
21 and 48 fold increase. So we don't have any uh, like real world evidence for these, but we just know that like, there's maintained binding. And then if I go down to the just effector functions, we have complete maintained effector functions. So I can only say from this in vitro, between in vitro neutralization and in vitro um, primary cell effector functions, we can compensate up to the current, like the highest value of neutralization decrease we've seen was like 48 fold. But I, I couldn't say where the, where the threshold would be. So is there, oh, oh I'm sorry, there's another, I was gonna ask a question, but I'll, I'll go to this. Since the Gary uh, uh, plus LS could have a stronger FCF function than LS alone, why choose uh, 7831 to go in the clinical clinic first? Yeah, that's also a good question. Of course, mm -hmm. that we also had like substantial discussion in house. Like as you have, I've shown you now, also, like so all the data you I've shown you now, we didn't have when the decision was done <laughs> back then. <laughs> so that's that's very recent data. So from this piece of data, we see that a combined increase of um, FC gamma receptor two A and three A in the GA Afuk variant looks very promising. Like we don't have the exact matching data with Galia, but um, Galia also has an increase on the 2A and the 3A. So, but now of course, um, now it's it's two years later. Back then we said potent effector function is good. Let's that move that forward. And on the side, let's test like the 7832. It's meaning with the Galia mutation. Great. Any, so I want to re remember, remind everyone, um, Mark uh, gave a, a terrific talk about uh, Ivashield, and I want to make sure that uh, I remind you to ask, you know, he's here to answer questions too. So um, uh, any, any thoughts there? Um, the, one, the one question I actually have for both is, um, and maybe I misunderstood, this is, you know, not my, my, the depth of my field, but but is there a um, you know I think Mark mentioned something about you know children who had been get who who had gotten uh, treatments. It took another infection to see the um, the change in response to a, a, a an enhancement. And is there are, are those kinds of is that kind of information available in the real world evidence for for what we have in, um, you know, let's say citrovimab in, in Europe where it's still being used. I mean, is, and, and I guess the same thing's true for Evashield. Is there any observation for second or third infection that would lead us to believe that um, there's, a, there's some utility in having uh, effector function or no effector function? Um, you know, I, it's, it's, Right now, it seems like most of these decisions were made hypothetically as opposed to on, on data. So, I, I mean, on, on clinical data. So what's the, you know, what's the, and is there anything from those kids' experiments or kids' treatments um, that um, give us a hint as to what to avoid? So maybe I'll dump, dump that first on Mark since he brought it up yeah. and he's, he's got the background and then we can, we can follow up with, with uh, Mika. Yeah, so, so I was referencing uh, some of the RSV vaccine studies that were done in the 60s that I imagine some of the folks on this call are familiar with. Um, so, you know, this is something we look for. We always look for adverse events and long-term follow-up. <clears throat> Interestingly, because of the half-life extender on heavy shell, we're following all the patients in our studies uh, out to 15 months. And, you know, we haven't seen any enhanced disease for sure. But interestingly, even in our treatment study, because of the different variants that have kind of swept through, we have seen secondary, second COVID infections in some of those patients. And of course, those rates are higher in the placebo group than in, than in the Evisheld group. So kind of a antibody works in treatment, but it's actually providing secondary benefit of preventing a secondary infection. And uh, it's something we presented at ID week at a, at a poster session and we plan to publish. With that, so reduced infection and also those that are infected have reduced severity or? 
Correct. I mean, it, it works in treatment. I showed you guys that data about, you know, 88% uh, uh, reduction in severe COVID if caught within three days of symptom onset. But then some of those patients, six, seven, eight, nine, 12 months later, got infected again. Um, and those infection rates were higher in the placebo group than the Evusheld group. So, oh. Yeah, that was that was a bit of a surprise too. And I think I submitted one for Michael on um, anti-drug antibodies. It's something you know for us folks working in biologics and antibodies, we track closely in all our studies. Do you see a difference between the galley and non-galley antibodies in eliciting anti-drug antibodies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Like I have to go back and check the details, but I don't think we saw dramatic differences between those two. I think your question might um, ask towards like, and that's something that I keep on uh, like bringing up that in the case, if we have potent, potent effector functions that also engineering to further increase phagocytosis and a vaccinal effect, T cell um, responses, there is a potential that we increase also the antibody drug, uh, anti drug antibodies. Um, that is a potential, and we are looking for that, but we haven't seen that up till now. So, and then another question to Mark from um, Jackie Kirshner how, how do you reconcile the active three results? Uh, not meeting a primary endpoint, but 30% decrease in all-cause mortality. Are you planning more studies to follow up? Yeah, um, you know, I think that the primary endpoint in the Active 3 study, you know, which was kind of return to, to normal, um, was, was a soft endpoint, in my opinion. I think something like mortality you know, hospital is, hospitalization being on a ventilator is a little harder endpoint, you know, it's more clear. So we were still in discussion whether we do another study. It's becoming harder and harder to run the hospitalization studies, fortunately. So there's no immediate plans, but it's something we're considering. I mean, and maybe since, since I have the microphone, I don't know, Lisa or any others, in some of those early hospitalization treatment studies, at least you know, my take looking at the data was there was actually enhanced uh, mortality in the folks that got the antibodies. You know, I think in the Regeneron study, they had kind of dissected that into the zero positives versus zero negatives, i.e. the zero positive subjects that got treated did worse than placebo, but it was the exact opposite for the zero negatives who did better than placebo. That's, that's I've often always been puzzled about it and wanted to ask that question. What, what, what's your take? Yeah, I think, Mark, it's, it was, I mean, the, I think those studies were done pretty early on um, in the pandemic, so before vaccination as well, obviously, right? So it was a little easier to do the, the uh, seropositive, seronegative um, split. Um, I think it's, I think, you know, we have to sort of, in the, taking a step back for what we know, at least for flu and other viral infections in terms of viral loads and how they sort of come up and then and then sort of come down. And the question is whether or not if you're looking at an antiviral antibody or a small molecule for that matter, you know, how does that interplay when, you know, you've got your viral load coming up and then an immune response of some sort um, that might be playing a, a bigger role in uh, those hospitalized populations. I think the other wild card there is, you know, just how long somebody was infected beforehand, and it's really hard to figure that out. You know, obviously the, the serology will give you some of that, um, but I don't think any of us really know overall the kinetics of the disease enough, you know, and obviously we were in the 614 era, not in the the current area with, with with Omicron at this point. So it's, you know, sort of a personal opinion around hospitalization and cross viral um, families, but um, really tough place to to really make a make a dent once people are are that sick. So I mean, one of the questions I think about is it's a different world with these antibodies now being used in 
basically everyone's either been vaccinated or exposed to the virus. Everybody's zero positive, maybe then hit infected or vaccinated against multiple multiple variants. I, I think it's a fundamentally different playing field than what we were doing dealing with in the heat of the pandemic in 2020 and early 2021, where most of the patients we were enrolling in our studies were naive. That's why I wanted to emphasize some of the real world evidence studies that we're doing, at least in the immunocompromised population. Um, you know, it's gratifying that the antibody's still working in, in these patient populations that have been vaccinated or previously exposed. I mean, one, one last point was, you know, which has puzzled me, uh, that every shell still showed really good efficacy against BA1 and BA1.1, where the IC50s had mm -hmm. uh, dropped well below 500 nanograms per mil or even above a microgram per mil. We were still seeing north of 90% efficacy against BA1 and BA1.1, even with that significant reduction in potency. So, you know, one of the takeaways is what we measure in a Petri dish is not what's translating into the clinic. I don't know if, we're, if I'm that much closer to understanding it, but um, I think the in vitro potencies are us underestimating the benefit. The, all, the, the whole, all antibodies can provide to patients is, is kind of my one takeaway. Yeah, I think that both from the neutralization point of view and the effector function point of view, how do we translate or make decisions on therapeutics based on these in vitro assays when we don't understand, you know, what's going on based on the real world evidence, at least in, in the COVID space at this point, totally agree. I think there was so, one last yeah. question, which actually I really want to get to because Mark, I did send this to you directly. Oh, and okay. Nicole, who uh, I know, and <laughs> Nicole Calward, um, thinks very similar, similarly to me sometimes, which um, I, I'm uh, honored that, that she does think that way. But um, she, she wondered from both of you, if you had the data that you have in hand now, um, how would you implement effector function in the future of new, in, in the future for, for new antibody programs. So if you, if you knew then what you did now, would you make the same decisions? And then also how do we use this moving forward? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So I'll stick to my guns. If, if we wanted an antibody, because we wanted it to be a Swiss army knife to be able to work in prevention and treatment. And so, you know, gave you guys a fly, you know, fly over of all our data where I think there is evidence that worked in both prevention all the way through hospitalization treatment, you know, with, with lots of caveats. So I would stay the same. If I was doing pure prevention, um, I would not put the TM um, modification in the antibody. Curious what the, what Michael thinks. What do you think, Mika? Yeah, I think it also depends very much on on the antibody. Like, of course, like yours is also a cocktail of two to then also broader span the spectrum of of spikes, whereas then we put on one antibody. And I think also what what it seems to come up is that like overall these like more like if one single antibody has a really broad neutralization against a big range of viruses, virus variants, then overall the single potency of that antibody just by pure neutralization can be lower. But then also then these effector functions are even more important. And another example was for influenza, for example, that there's very type specific antibodies against the head of the influenza HA. And so they are very potent and are completely don't need effector functions at all. But then against like a stem antibody, really they are much broader and can neutralize all of influenza A's, for example, but then are depending partially on the effector function. So I think it depends a lot of the, so if the, so that's why it's overall the strategy also already during the phase of the selection of the antibody and discovery. If one goes for a single antibody, which is supposed to be like very broad, then I think effector functions are even more important. And yeah. Well, this has been a very excellent um, conversation, discussion, lots of, lots of good questions. And I'm, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to, to drop off because we're at 11.29, but um, I just wanna thank our speakers once again, Mark and Mika, really terrific um, uh, seminars, talks, and uh, set us up for what I think is gonna be a great series of, of talks over the next few months. So. Um, 
there's another one Friday for those who don't realize. So let's uh, hope to see you all again. And uh, we will, yep, there it is. And uh, so that's uh, Jim Crow, who all of you know. Um, and so, so uh, looking forward to that on Friday from one to two Eastern time. And uh, if you don't have that information, uh, contact Trey or I or anyone on the on, on the panel here. And uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you see you again real soon. But once again, uh, Mark and Mika, thank you so much. This is a great start to uh, the the um, the series. Lisa, thanks if anything. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. This